Welcome back to episode 68 of Count Me In, IMA's podcast about all things affecting the accounting and finance world. I'm your host, Adam Larson, and today we'll be listening to an important conversation about the tax implications and guidelines for individuals and small to mid-sized businesses following the various government loans in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Paul Miller is a CPA with over 30 years of experience in the accounting industry. Keep listening to hear how he's been advising his clients during these uncertain times. All right, Paul, so to start off in general, you're an accountant. Uh, from the clients that you work with, what are some of the trends that you've seen, whether it's individuals or businesses following this COVID-19 crisis? Everyone wants to know how to or, or, or have obtained the Paychecks Protection Program and what it means to them, how they have to spend it. That's been the general focus of the last two weeks. And it's very demanding. Um, I've been engaging a lot with an employment attorney because a lot of people are, um, they have to be very careful that this is going to be scrutinized at some time. And they have to be sure that they follow the first set of rules if they got the first trench of money and the second set of rules if they got the second trench of money. So you have to navigate them. And I'm trying to navigate at the latter because I think that's more conservative than the first set of um, economic rules. So I've been referring clients to an SBA attorney, and I've been referring clients to a labor attorney. And simultaneously, we've constructed and we're going to launch it today, which is a spreadsheet that gives people not an official guideline, but like a checker. So you could keep track of where you're at, where your spending's at, where your headcount's at. That's that's one of the most important things today that most of my businesses are focused on, the people who actually went out and got the money. I did have two or three clients obtain loans and return them for, for their business is not in economic uncertainty anymore. So, you know, particularly in the U.S., we here are very familiar with the stimulus package. Um, you know, these government loans you mentioned and as a result of that, or you know, on top of that, we've also recently seen the extension of the standard April 15th tax deadline. So that's been pushed back. And you know, with your clients and everything you're working with with these attorneys, what does the tax deadline mean now for everybody? And really, I guess you could start with the individual um, or wherever direction you want to go. But what can people expect from this extension? Well, it's, it's, a, it's definitely great. There's two, there's, two, there's two schools of thought, right? The people who owe money and the people who are getting a refund. The people who are getting a refund want to file. Problem is if your return contains any paper documents, your return's not getting processed. The IRS has um, made an announcement that they're not processing manual returns. So if you have any manual attachment or you have to file by paper, you're not getting a refund. Um, for people who owe, and you would have owed on April 15th, that extends everything till July 15th. So there's no penalties, no interest, you go to July 15th. There are states that have, break, have broken from the federal government that a lot of your audience needs to be aware of. For example, New Hampshire is expecting their tax return on June 15th. DC expected their first estimate on April 15th. So you have to pay attention to where you file, you have to pay attention is the extension for not only the federal, but has the state connected with the federal and decided to align themselves and not break from uh, and have you have a separate filing and put you under stress. And then what about from the business side of things, the small to medium sized firms? Uh, let's say you receive some of these government loans. You know, what does that mean for your taxes and your filing and everything else you need to be aware of? Well, again, this is fluid, so it's changing every day, right? So as of today, the money that you received is not taxable. The money that you, um, the money that you, the expenses that you pay are not deductible. And the, the difference that you're not forgiven is a loan over 24 months at 1%. So many of our listeners, they're management accountants, right? They're really focused on the operations, the strategy within the business. With this kind of money and uh, the different stipulations, as you just outlined for us, 
what does that mean to their day-to-day roles, you know, within the smaller business, even if you're a sole proprietor, um, as far as the planning, overall performance of the business, what are you recommending to your clients? Well, there's two schools of thought. You know, if you took the money, the money was to bring your staff back. Okay, I'm, I'm going to, again, it's fluid, so I'll blend it in. I've, I'm, I've been telling people to preserve capital because you don't know how long this is going to last. Access to capital is very important. I'm explaining to people that it's not, that it, what, your, what is your objective? I asked that question to the employee. Is it to forgive the money and you're not worried about your business or your business is going to sustain and be fine anyway? Or is your concern, I need the cash flow because another disconnect with this PPP program, the Paychecks Protection Program, is the government has not aligned themselves with the states. So technically, from the day you receive the money, you have eight weeks to spend it. That really doesn't line up in a lot of states because a lot of businesses may be a different phase and not open. So you may ask people to come back to work and they may not want to come back to work. Technically, and I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to speak legally, but it's my understanding you're supposed to write a letter to the employee saying your job is available, we're willing to pay you, and then you're supposed to notify unemployment and then put them on family leave. This has been a big challenge for a lot of people. When should a a business, an individual, really seek some additional guidance like yourself here? I know uh, you've obviously dealt with clients. We were talking about it just before we got on here, uh, all over the place, right? So when is the, is there a threshold or a point in time where you say, uh, or you've seen people are, you know, right in time, or maybe it's too late before they contact an accountant and start to plan how to work through all this loan, all these loans and the different tax extensions and such, you know, when is that point in time that you really need to get in touch with an accountant? the minute you get the money. Uh, I think if you're not working with your accountant or your accountant's not up on top of this, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You know, you know, you know people, uh, there's so much information out there. We, we send out very limited emails in bulk to have effectiveness so that when people get them, I'm getting calls from other clients who have accountants and say, I just want to thank you for your email. I'm trying to give people the guidance that I get, not only from what I read, I talk, to, I talk to clients, I have clients who are lobbyists who are working on the bill, they're working on the revision of the bill. I talk to, um, I have friends at the SBA just trying to get as much information as I can to get my clients as informed as they possibly can. And I think a client who does not seek counsel is, unless they took a little bit of money, they may, they may not have a high risk, but if you took anything over 50 grand or over 100,000, you have to be mindful that everybody above 2 million is going to get audited and they're going to audit small people. And it's not going to be really hard to audit you. You know, th- this is a headcount driven test. And they're going to ask you for a lot of detailed information. And one of the documents I'm trying to get my hands on is what does the forgiveness worksheet look like? And that has not been drafted yet. Sure. So, um, you know, you just mentioned the audit. What other risks are there for individuals who are collecting this money? To be committing a crime. You know, there's a, I don't think it's the government's intention to prosecute people, but I had a client the other day tell me that they got $6.6 million. I told them, and you didn't get a legal opinion? They're actually, she, the, the woman's a friend of mine. She's a controller of a, of a quasi public company. And I said, You took the money without a legal opinion. And she was like, We're confident that we're okay. I'm like, Okay. I had another person who took $400,000 using the real estate business. He returned the money. A lot of people don't want to go under the government scrutiny. We don't know. There's that old saying, nothing, Nothing's for free. You know what I mean? I would just tell everybody listening to try to pay as careful attention to the law as possible. So I guess to really wrap things up, you know, from what you've seen, what you envision coming up in the future, what are some of the takeaways that businesses or individuals uh, should learn from this? What recommendations do you have for future business operations and future handling of money 
um, after all this crisis? When the crisis is over, it's going to teach you a lesson. You know, you have to have some bunker money. You have to be aware of the unexpected living way above your means, which is what the government's doing and advising clients by having a massive deficit and saying it's okay to spend more than you make. Um, you need to be prepared. You need to be prepared not only for today, but for tomorrow to have a certain amount of money put aside so that you can support your staff and support your business and make capital investments, especially in the time like now. Now I find there's an incredibly good opportunity for people who are, you know, in the professional services business where they should be marketing themselves, not today, but for tomorrow. The SBA attorney that, I, that I'm working with was an M&A attorney. He's taken several classes to become SBA and flipped his career for the interim while he's doing SBA work. So there's a lot of things you have to say to yourself, you know, the world is funny. It's, it's, not, it's never what it was. It's never what it's going to be. So this is uh, an interesting time going forward where we're going to have harder bank rules to get financial statements, going to have harder lending rules where it's going to make businesses even harder to get money, even though the government is rolling out the next line of loans, which is the Main Street Lending Program, which will be the next thing that a lot of people will be talking about. In addition to, if you want to talk about it for a few minutes, a lot of people are now being offered their S, uh, their EIDL loan. A lot of people are now getting the acceptance, and it varies from as little as fourteen hundred I've seen up to one hundred and fifty thousand, where it's now capped. And I'm recommending to a lot of my clients, and this the clarity is becoming um, it's becoming clearer that you can take the idle loan, and it won't reduce, so you won't have to refinance your PPP, but you can't spend the money for the same purposes you use the PPP money for. So. Again, it's not official yet, but that's my understanding. Um, and if that's the case, I'm recommending to a lot of my clients to take the money. It, it's interest and principal for free and you could prepay it at any time. So that could give you an extra cushion to maybe pay your vendors, to maybe pay your suppliers and um, or, or market or do some things that will need to be done to get your business um, redirected um, and back, back up online. So I get, this will be my last question for you. Um, with all this available funding and lessons learned, so on and so forth, what are the opportunities coming out of this? I know we talked a lot about some of the negatives, some of the risks, but you know, what kind of positives do you see potentially coming out of this? Oh, there's tremendous, tr tremendous opportunities. There's going to be acquisitions with, where companies can't survive. You know, th th there's going to be tremendous buying opportunities. Look, where, where one person loses, another person gains. And the person who's in a better financial position will capitalize on, um, on this market. And it doesn't necessarily mean the rich get richer. Smarter businesses that, like architectural firms that couldn't do it on their own, maybe they group their businesses together and they work better together to bring in jobs and cross over you know, what they do. A lot of different things are going. There's going to be a lot of activity in um, either M&A or in acquisitions or restructuring businesses. That's what I see. I think it's going to be all, you know, once we get through the downturn and, and people, this is pushing the digital age forward faster. And um, it's going to teach people they're going to need to retool themselves, being more computer literate. And it's going to advance a lot of things that, you know, we were slowly getting there. It's kind of accelerated it. You know, so the... I can do a Zoom meeting. I don't need to fly across the country. I can do, the, you know what I mean? Things like that are, are very obvious that are going to save companies money. But, you know, the, the real estate industry will have to refigure themselves out. And um, there'll be a lot of uh, figuring going on. This has been Count Me In, IMA's podcast, providing you with the latest perspectives of thought leaders from the accounting and finance profession. If you like what you heard and you'd like to be counted in for more relevant accounting and finance education, visit IMA's website at www.imanet.org.